Yo Atlas speaking and welcome back to the Atlas fanfic channel on YouTube today. I'm here to present the fourth Naruto fanfiction story I'm adding to the roster and what if I was reborn in Naruto as a prodigy Uzumaki part 1. And without further ado let the tale begin. Chapter 1 Part 1 As a kid, I always thought that being a hero would be cool, right? Risking my life, saving the day, the acclaim, and access to whatever the hell I wanted through obsessive fans. I'd settle for being the villain, a smart one, and take the infamy, fear of my name, and the other cool things associated with it, minus the indecent defeat at the hands of a naive goody-goody. I thought it would be cool, I had fantasies about saving the day, or ruining it, depending on my mood, but it was never serious. I had a habit of chickening out when faced with any serious choices. Remember, if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, remember what happened to a boy who was good, and kind, and brave, asterisk. Sure, I was just a little pipsqueak when I read that specific series, but the story has absolutely nothing to do with this, just the words. I was walking along, minding my own business in the hustle and bustle of the big city. I think I was going to get my driver's license renewed, but I might have been filing my taxes, either way it didn't matter. I was minding my own business when I saw a kid getting shaken down by some mugger, barely out of sight of anyone except those directly in front of the alley. It seemed horribly cliché, but I stopped and those words ran through my head. My cell phone was in my hand, but I realized that the cops would take too long to arrive. I could have called them anyways, crime was their problem, not mine, but I knew that would have just been the easy way out. I took a picture of the mugger and stepped into the alley. I wasn't being brave or even all that stupid. The mugger couldn't have been more than high school age and the kid was a middle schooler at best, so it wasn't much more than breaking up a schoolyard fight. Little old lady teachers could do it, so I, a full-grown man, could stop it without much of a problem, right? Since I felt like I was walking on cliches already, I decided to keep hitting it on the nose. You know, kid, you really should pick on someone your own size. Stay out of this old guy. That was a bit offensive. I wasn't even 30 yet, for heaven's sake. I grabbed the teen's wrist. Let the little one go, I ordered. The teen released the kid, who ran like the hounds of hell nipped at his heels. I let go and was about to walk away when I heard the distinctive click of a gun behind me. Almost at once, I heard the bang, felt a sharp pain in the back of my skull, which raced through my entire scalp. My thoughts were along the lines of, um, really, asshole? The situation was over and I still get shot for my troubles. I expected to wake up in one of three places, the hospital, which I was hoping for, heaven, which I wouldn't mind the slightest, or hell, which I sincerely hoped wasn't an option. Imagine my surprise when I found myself slowly spinning on playground swings watching a handful of orphaned redheads run around a merry-go-round. And my front four teeth missing. I used up quite a bit of my cool when I recognized one of them as Uzumaki Kushina from a manga, Naruto, I read in high school. I had about 20% of my cool remaining when the kids started screaming in terror and my swing stopped spinning as I faced the opposite direction, the village we were so obviously a part of being attacked by blurs and a heavy mist descending over everything. I knew what was going on. I didn't remember the entire story, but key points stood out to me and I had always been especially interested in the time before the beginning of canon. An adult ran towards us, picking up a child and attempting to flee, but was cut down, along with the little boy. I was very happy that what was right and what was easy fit together at that moment. This was not something I could fight and those damn kids didn't deserve to be cut down, nor did an attacking shinobi deserve to have the slaughter of orphans on their conscience. I spun and dashed towards the group of kids faster than I had ever run before, grabbed the first two arms I reached and yanked the terrified children towards the wild trees scarred and gnarled by seawater with Kushina and another boy each dragging another kid behind them. Two more kids caught on and raced after us while the others ran towards the village, calling for the orphanage caretakers. 
I led the group through the woods and to the docks where someone left boats painted with seals. I don't know how I knew they were there, I just did. I shoved my two kids into the boat, followed by Kushina and the little girl she grabbed. The last four leaped into their own accord while I yanked the ropes free from the dock, like any good little boy scout from a port city knew how, threw them into the boat, then shoved it away from the dock. When it was far enough away, I took a running leap off the dock, just as Akiri Shinobi appeared in the tree line. He ran forward and nearly caught my shoe, but I made it to the boat, if barely, with my knees cracking painfully against the side and sure I broke the wrist of the poor kid I landed on. The boat lurched about fifteen yards further into the strait, totaling twenty or so yards away from the deck. I should not have been able to make a five-yard jump, I certainly didn't question it until I was sure I was nice and safe. The shinobi grinned and stepped out onto the water to follow, throwing a brace of kunai into the boat. Kushina scrambled up to shout, I am Uzumaki Kushina and you will leave us alone. She held up her hands in a familiar cross sign while an internal chant of get your scrawny, bony knees out of my spine began in my head. Miss Rose and the water swirled angrily around the boat, destroying the footing of the shinobi and dragging him beneath the water where he was dashed against the dock, his neck very obviously broken. Kushina collapsed and I barely managed to roll beneath her so she fell inside the boat instead of overboard. Everything went silent, even the poor girl whose arm I broke. I, for one, was extremely proud of myself for saving eight kids, all under the age of six, from the massacre of Yuzushio Bikur, when formerly, only Kushina survived. Until I saw the state we were in. I know I can never be a true hero and I will never try and lay claim to that title. I was too selfish. If I hadn't felt that there would be future strength in numbers, I would have just fled. Now, since there wasn't any active threat, I could spend a minute or so bemoaning the fact I had red hair that was a bit long for any self-respecting boy and was currently seven, which some niggling thing in the back of my head proudly informed me. Puberty had been bad the first time, with acne and a bit of a fanaticism for stories over playing video games like the cool kids. The story fanaticism never faded. I hadn't been great at sports, overly smart, or hard-working so I never stood out, except when less sociable me was chosen for the brunt of immature jokes. Not that I paid enough attention to the other kids to care. Still, even though my first go-around hadn't been all that bad, I was not looking forward to another. Even so, from the way six children barely old enough for school were looking at me, Kushina was out for the count and the girl with the broken arm was hunched over in pain and struggling not to make any noise, I had to take the lead. My adult thought process immediately broke down the situation into smaller, manageable tasks. The entire group was injured in some way, many of the injuries could become much more severe if left untreated for much longer, so I tackled that first, careful to keep my voice down. Everyone sit with your backs to the edge of the boat, but one at a time and go where I tell you. It was difficult to speak without my front teeth, but I managed. The boat was about the size of a large canoe and I was extremely thankful that orphans were generally undersized as a rule so there was just barely enough room for us to move without capsizing the boat. I directed three kids to press their backs against each side of the boat and drag the unconscious Kushina into one of the places while commissioning the strongest and oldest looking boy to help me with the girl with the broken arm. The boy I chose was also the only older kid not injured by the kunai throne. I felt a bit sick as the blood in the bottom of the canoe was a bit more than just smears. I didn't have a lot of time. I grabbed one of the kunai embedded in the wood and pulled the ribbon out of the little girl's hair, cut it in half, and tied the kunai around the broken arm as a makeshift brace, then told the girl to hold her arm against her chest, quickly replacing her with another boy who had a kunai through his upper arm and lodged in his rib. The boy commissioned to help me and a second volunteer held the whimpering kid down while I yanked the blade out. They kept the pressure on the wounds while I stripped off my shirt and cut it into strips, swallowing down the bile at being forced to play ER doctor, the whole time chewing on my tongue in the empty space in the front of my mouth. I knew the basics of first aid, I did a brief stint as a lifeguard in high school, 
but those classes did absolutely nothing for preparing me for taking care of eight red-headed kids stranded on the water that I was certain contained deadly whirlpools that would shake us to death. It took two more volunteered shirts before the wounds were bandaged well enough to stop us from bleeding out. I then stood at the rudder, which I found quite odd for such a small boat, and kept us pointed in the direction towards the mainland, searching for help of any kind, while the others huddled against the side of the boat. Somehow, I never needed to say much. It only took a few motions, maybe a word or two to direct the frightened kids around. The attack had started in the morning, and by the time everything was sorted out, it was long past noon. I feared the cold that would accompany the night with wind that could kill us without even a blanket to cover. It wasn't a particularly cold day, with the clear skies and sun, but the night could be dangerous. I prayed to whatever god in charge of this universe that someone would chance across us, or that the other side of the strait would appear in sight. Kushina still hadn't woken and I hoped she would have an answer when she did. It was almost supper time and I was starting to second-guess my chosen method of death. The shock was beginning to wear off and the younger kids had begun to whimper in pain, fear, and cold while the blood had long since soaked into the wood. I felt sick from exposure to the sun and all of us were dehydrated. The smallest of girls had fallen unconscious. Our short arms couldn't even reach the seawater to pull that into drink. Thankfully, Kushina was showing signs of waking. It was nighttime when she finally regained consciousness and the cold had begun to set in. I could feel the first tremors setting into my small, half-clothed body, which didn't have the immunity to the cold my adult body had built up. Do you have any ideas to get us to safety, Kushina? I asked once she was alert enough to respond. She picked herself up and stumbled over to me. For the second time, I had to stop her from going overboard on accident. She leaned heavily on me, while I leaned heavily on the aft of the boat and inspected the seals on the rudder handle. This one. Put chakra into that seal, it won't take much, and it will send out a distress signal to any nearby, local, civilian vessels, but it's too late for any of them to get it. That seal there will take you to the nearest mainland port so we can tell someone what happened and get help, but I can't do it, I don't have enough left. Um, can anyone else use chakra? I asked hopefully. The kids shook their head. All right. We'll start there. Um, what do I have to do? It was sitting on the bottom of a bloodstained boat, in the middle of a strait, terrified of freezing to death, with a bunch of kids, my hair itching my face, and taught by a six-year-old Fuinjutsu prodigy that I learned to access chakra and sealed my fate as a shinobi of the new world I found myself in. I figured it was only almost as frightening and hellish as hell itself. On the bright side, I had a good story I could make, rather than just passively absorb the work of others for once. If the moon followed the same time pattern as the sun, I wasn't sure because I had never needed the sky to tell me the time, nor was I interested, we reached the docks around midnight. Unfortunately for me and Kushina, the only ones of the group brave enough to speak to Nanazumaki Shinobi, it was at the exact same time as the Kanoa Shinobi and Porus were snatched out of our boat and dragged into an abandoned shack to be interrogated by the leader of the Kanoa team sent to aid Yuzushi Obikure. One of the Shinobi I recognized immediately. Hataki Sakumo, the white fang, though he looked much, much younger than I remembered. Here's the deal, kids. I know you're from Yuzu and my team and I are headed there now to help your families, but we need as much information as you can remember. Can you tell me anything? Everyone immediately looked to me and a few pointed as well. My brother Kichiro can tell you better than anyone what happened. He's really smart and strong. He saved us, Kushina said, and the other kids agreed. The brother part caught me by surprise, and I hoped I regained the memories of this Kichiro kid because I most certainly didn't want to be accused of being an infiltrator. Maybe I could arrange a convenient knock on the head and forget everything as soon as the trauma died down. For now, though, I had to do my best to make sure that Hitaki Sakumo survived whatever his mission was, but I at least had the tact to not want to tell the shinobi about the attack in front of a group of children. 
Sakumo picked up on my uneasiness and led me out of the sheltered shack, carefully wrapping a warm blanket around me so I didn't freeze in the night air. Tell me everything, kid. I automatically felt my back straighten as we stopped behind a nearby house. Except for one or two who might have slipped through the cracks, the entire population is dead, I started out bluntly. There was no reason to mince my words, the man was a shinobi, he could take it. Um, they used to miss Jutsu to confuse everyone and obscure vision, simultaneously reducing the effectiveness of traps. The village never stood a chance. We escaped because we were at an orphanage near the strait. None of us have any family left to lose. We were all orphaned before the attack. It was all starting to sink in for real now. I had just saved eight other kids from certain death when I remembered the actual story of this world well enough that only Kushina should have survived. I had saved eight kids. Those eight kids now owed their lives to me and I was now responsible for them. I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I was going to let them down simply because I could barely take care of myself as an adult. How the hell was seven-year-old me in a world I barely remembered from my childhood supposed to do anything right? Hey! Stay with me, Kichiro. I still need you to tell me how you got out. I shamefully scrubbed at my eyes. We were on the playground when the mist appeared. I grabbed who I could and ran to the boats. We all jumped in but someone tried to chase us. Kushina, um, killed them with some jutsu and eventually we made it here. The shinobi had a kiri forehead protector. What did Kushina's jutsu look like? Sakumo asked, grabbing my arm to stop me from tipping over. I had made a giant, um, whirlpool around us that dashed him against the dock. You've done well, Kichiro, don't let anything lead you to think any differently. I didn't want to do anything. I stamped my foot with an immaturity that would have horrified me if I wasn't upset over the responsibility that I had hung about my own neck. Kichiro, listen to me, the Hataki ordered and put both hands on my shoulders. Just because you saved those kids' lives, you're not responsible for them. How old are you? Six? Seven? You're not expected in any way to take care of yourself, much less anyone else, all right? I looked up at him wishing I was actually a kid and not able to see the way adults use their adult power to force kids into their point of view. You shouldn't feel that way, kid, all right? I couldn't believe it. How the hell could I just change my entire point of view because the man just said so? The Hataki released me and I couldn't help myself. I punched the man in the face. Maybe it was the fact that I was smaller than his leg and he straight up did not expect me to try anything like that. Or, maybe it was the fact that I had a decent mask for my anger and he was not expecting me to be able to hide them as well as I did. It surprised me as much as him that the strike actually connected and had the strength to snap his head to the side. Given, I had channel chakra to reinforce my bones and muscles, but I still surprised myself. I didn't miss how he had drawn his tanto and channel chakra into the blade before he managed to stop himself when I took a step back and cringed. Well, at least I'd have the bragging rights that I punched the white fan. He rubbed his jaw, studying me carefully. You're right, kid. You're not a shinobi yet so I can't ask you to turn off your thoughts and feelings at will. I'll tell you this, though. You're a good person and a leader whether you want to be or not. You're the kind of person I want watching my back because I know you'll do your job whether you want to or not. Who knows, one day you might just be on my team. I stood there gaping at him. In his own roundabout way, he had offered me a place on his team. Now, kid, you may still have all that adrenaline pumping through your body, but that gash on your head looks pretty nasty and I think our dear medic has finished up with your friends. They're not my friends, I corrected him. I don't even know their names. Except for Kushina. He ignored me and took my hand to lead me back to the others. While we walked, I prodded at the gash in my right temple and noticed that the blood had coated the whole side of my head and down over my shoulder. Well, 
I guess that could cover the memory loss if need be, considering I didn't even remember hitting my head, which was probably a bad thing. Walking into the little shack they had contained the kids and was a second punch to the gut. Standing up from where she knelt beside the youngest kid to survive, who was nearly five, was Tsunade. I probably shouldn't have been surprised. It was the village of her extended family that had been attacked and she had to have been a damn good medic for her age to be sent to help. Medicine, without a formal, standardized education program in place, had to be a lifelong profession. I shied away as she turned to me and pressed her palm against the gash on my head. I found it hard to trust someone I knew to be a drunk, at least in the future. Oh, stop your flinching, kid. I know exactly what I'm doing and I promise not to hurt you. With quick, practiced movements, she ran her hands across the front of my chest and down my arms, stopping to heal the damage to my wrist where I had caught myself in the boat, shaking her head at something while she turned me around and ran a hand down my back then down the sides of both legs, healing the damage to my knees from jerking backwards over the edge of the boat. Right, kid, I'm surprised you were able to function at all. Your skull had a depression fracture and you had a pretty severe concussion. Don't get too frustrated if you have trouble making your body work like you feel it should be working. Also, I can't tell for certain because I'm not a Yamanaka, but I think you've lost a lot of your memories. If you were older, it wouldn't be as much of a problem, but for now, you have a nearly clean slate. Since I don't know your baseline, I have no idea how severe the damage is and I won't dare try and repair it here without getting a second opinion on the matter. For now, we're going to get all of you to Konoha and make sure you're safe. Wait! Kushina cried out. Does that mean Nisan doesn't remember me? Tsunade looked at me for the answer. I shook my head, a bit stunned at the fact I was the brother to a future Jinchuriki and the linchpin of the entire story, and she wasn't just messing around, not that I thought she would mess around in a situation like this. Kushina wrapped her arms around me. It's all right. I'll tell you everything about you so you don't have to not remember anymore. I nodded, slightly freaked out as she squirmed into the blanket beside me. The adults left and the others began to doze off while Kushina and I sat against the door. The boy confirmed that Kiri Shinobi were attacking the village and he claims that it's already been ransacked. We can leave someone here to guard the kids and go on, or we can rush back to the village and get a larger force to back us up when searching for survivors. Sakumo laid out while I felt the wall shift slightly as someone leaned against it. Kushina clung to me and I found myself more than a little uncomfortable at the proximity. If it is Kiri, we're in no shape to fight. Only Tsunade has a proper earth affinity. A strange spoke up. So we're just abandoning them? Tsunade demanded. There are nine kids and there we're saving, Tsunade. Are you going to risk their lives by getting in over our heads? A second stranger spoke up. She has a point. A third stranger cut in. The voice sent chills down my back. Those kids may be Uzumaki, their resilience and longevity will be beneficial, but it seems that except for the girl, Kushina, they know almost nothing of their clan heritage, considering they're orphans. Only her and the boy, Kichiro, appear to have any talent for the shinobi arts. Tsunade looked at their chakra networks and none of the others have any notable potential. Despite their general health, the Uzumaki are a mostly civilian clan to begin with. We have Mito-sama's knowledge, so not all will be lost. Both options have equal drawbacks and advantages, Sakumo answered. You all need to vote, there's nine of you if I remain impartial. Who thinks we should head back with the kids and bring back a stronger force? There was a long pause. Five to four, sorry Tsunade, we're heading back. Set up a perimeter around the shack. Tsunade, if the kids need anything, it'll be up to you, the rest of us will take our long shifts in pairs, I'll take the two sunrise shifts. We leave as soon as the kids wake up and have eaten. No! Tsunade protested. We leave now and carry them. They can sleep as we run. They only just got off that boat, are you sure? 
they're just tired and hungry, we can stop to eat in the morning, but the sooner we get back to Kanoha, the sooner we can get help to Yuzu. Can everyone handle that? A chorus of affirmation answered him. Right. Tsunade, they're most familiar with you, why don't you bring them out and we'll wrap them in our blankets to keep them from freezing in the wind. The door opened and I found that annoying thing in the back of my head tightening my arm around Kushina. Tsunade crouched in front of me. Hey, kiddo, we're going to head back to Kanoha as fast as we can so. I heard your discussion. You were supposed to be asleep, she reproached. I shrugged. Well, wait here for a minute, all right? I nodded and she started to pick up the sleeping kids and carry them to the door, waking them up just enough to meet the person carrying them. She disentangled Kushina from me last and carried her out. I followed her, tightening the blanket around my shoulders and dreading the indignity of being carried for who knows how long. Orochimaru, your last, Sakumo said as Tsunade led me out with Kushina's face buried in the woman's neck. I'm not carrying some snot-nosed kid for hours. Carry him yourself, I'll run scout. Sakumo rolled his eyes and crouched down. Come on, kid, hop on my back, he told me. I couldn't do it. I hated being carried my first time as a kid and as an adult I even stayed out of the piggyback races when messing around after having a bit too much to drink. I'll walk, I crossed my arms stubbornly. Sakumo met my gaze for a moment before motioning for the others to move out without us. We're not going to be walking, kid. Then I'll run. If you were a Janin, I would consider it, but you won't be able to keep up with us. We don't have the time to teach you to tree hop, and you don't have the stamina to make it back to Kanoha. You need to rest more than anything and I'm not above forcing you to sleep, got it? You can ride on my back and tolerate it, or you can wake up when we reach the village gates. Why can't I stay here? You'll freeze kid, even with that blanket, or you'll be either captured or killed. I ignored that statement. Sakumo crouched down and patted the ground beside him. I remain standing. You and I both know that this isn't about being carried. What's the real problem? I studied him carefully. I certainly wasn't a hero, but he clearly was. If I told you, you'd think I was insane. Try me. He was sincere, that much was certain. He genuinely wanted to help and I was significantly tempted to let him, simply because he could. If I could trust him. On one condition. He thought carefully. What condition? That you don't betray my trust by telling anyone else, no matter the circumstances, or think I'm crazy or evil. As a shinobi, I can't make that promise, kid. I'm required to disclose everything to my Hokage, pertinent or not. Then lead me here and catch up with your team. I'll be fine, I promise. I knew I couldn't back that up. I am extremely capable of forcing you to come. But you won't, because you're not that kind of person, Hataki Sakumo. How do you know my name? I sat down beside him and pulled up my knees, not meeting his gaze. He sighed. I will not lie to the Hokage if I'm asked directly, but I will keep you secret and hear what you have to say with an open mind. Swear on everything and everyone you care about. That was probably overboard, but I wasn't going to take it back. I couldn't be too careful. I swear. I decided to start with the bad news. If nothing changes, in the wake of the, um, Third Great Shinobi World War, someone who hasn't been born yet is going to release the QB on Kanoha and devastate the village. Do I have your attention? I watched Sakumo carefully out of the corner of my eye. His hand tightened into a fist, but otherwise, he gave no reaction. That is an entirely plausible scenario, but you have absolutely no way to prove it. What if I could? Then I fear the two wars that are looming in the future much more than the attack of a bijou. I know there is much more to this story. Let's start with the obvious question. Why are you telling me, of all people? Why are you listening? Because I have an obligation to my village. 
I may not know a lot about you, but I respect you more than you know. The impact you make on others, both good and bad, will carry further than you can imagine. You seem to have an inflated image of me, kid. I'm not as influential as you seem to think. There's no way for an orphan from Yuzu to know who I am. It will make more sense in a bit. I paused before deciding to start from the beginning. I died this morning. There was a kid, probably eleven or twelve getting bullied by a teenager. I broke it up and once the kid was gone, I turned around and the teenager killed me. I was twenty-seven. I died, but it wasn't in this world. When I woke up, I was spinning on the swings in Yuzu watching a bunch of orphans. I can't prove it, I just know it's true. Say I decide to write you off as hallucinating. What would you do? Just walk away. I would hide in a small, forgotten village and let events play out. It all turns out fine in the end. And if I believe you? I'll tell you everything and fight like hell to keep them alive and stop the Fourth Shinobi World War, which is infinitely worse than any war you can imagine. Then tell me everything. I was quite thankful that age wasn't a determining factor of worth to a shinobi. Well, before I died, there was a story that I haven't read for years. I didn't tell him everything, I skipped over a lot of details, like relationships, who had kids, and things like that while avoiding specifics, like who exactly was sent to the Canopy Bridge and who the Yandame was going to be. It took me less than five minutes. You haven't told me much, Sakumo commented. I don't remember much and things have already changed, there's no way it can stay the same now. Well, I guess we're now going to fight like hell to keep people alive, aren't we? You're not going to tell your Hokage. He's your Hokage now too. You'll be a shinobi like me, right? I've been enlisted in the military, but I spent four years in communication. I'm not cut out to fight directly. You can do it, I'm sure of it, Kichiro. For now, I think you've been working too hard. You need to rest. Sakumo laid a hand on my head and the night's ambient light faded. Chapter 2 A week later, a chunin escorted me and Kushina from the tiny apartment we had been given to the Shinobi Academy. The small stipend for food and necessities was barely enough for us to buy a change of clothes and two meals a day. It wouldn't be enough to cover much more but I could stretch it far enough. Nisan? I wasn't sure exactly when I started off and on thinking of Kushina as my sister but I convinced myself it was when that niggling bubble in the back of my head finally burst a few days before. Most of the time, I was successful in ignoring the real Kichiro jabbering on, but sometimes he annoyed the hell out of me. Nisan? He said pointedly. I ignored them both, stubbornly staring straight ahead at the Chunin's back. Nisan? Are you all right? Kushina asked. My hands clenched when the mocking came. If you don't say something this second, I swear I'll. Nisan. Listen to me. Um, I'm listening, Kushina, what is it? There's something I really need to tell you. Then tell me, I answered simply, putting my arm around her shoulders. It's a secret. Then whisper it. I'll tell you later, okay? Um, okay? Nisan? What? Look! She shoved her hand in my face, making me go cross-eyed trying to see what was between her fingers. I grabbed her wrist and held it at a reasonable distance. It's a tooth. Yeah. I lost it this morning. Cool. Maybe the tooth fairy would visit you. She gave me an odd look. Tooth fairy? Yeah. What's that? You put the tooth under your pillow at night and then the tooth fairy come, takes it, and leaves a coin behind. I've never heard of it. If you don't believe in her, she won't come. Did she come when you lost your teeth? Yep. I lied for both me and Kichiro. Small things like the Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny, and Santa Claus were the small wonders that made a childhood memorable and happier. 
If I was stuck taking care of Kushina via Kichiro in my head, I might as well make it a little bit more magical. Besides, kids who didn't get the small wonders never seemed to be very happy. The Chunin leading us sent me an odd look, but eventually ignored the conversation. You never said anything. I shrugged. You never say much. I shrugged again and she giggled. So she'll come tonight? Sure. Promise? Promise. The Chunin turned to us and stopped outside the doors of a school building. Here is the academy. I hope you remember the way because this is the only time you will receive an escort, kids. I can't tell you where your class is, but it's in there somewhere. I look forward to serving alongside you. At that, he was gone. Kushina lifted my arm off her shoulders and threaded her fingers through mine, squeezing tightly. I led the way through the doors, remembering what Sakumo told me the last time I saw him. Keep your sister safe, kiddo, and you can start that fight you swore to. Uzumaki. Both of you. Someone called the second we stepped through the doors. In here. We were directed into two separate rooms and asked what felt like thousands of innocuous questions before we were reunited and ushered into a classroom a few minutes after the beginning of the class began. As a real seven-year-old placed in front of a class of my peers, I probably would have been more than a little nervous, but to me, they were just kids, nothing to be afraid of. The teacher quieted the talking with a small bit of killing intent. I pushed the recognition of blatant mental conditioning out of my head and focused on the Chunin's words before I said something I would regret. All right, class, we have two new students. Would you like to introduce yourself and your sister? He asked me. I bit back a rude comment about his continuing killing intent while Kushina tugged at my hand. Please oblige the teacher before I say something I'll regret, I muttered to her so only she could hear. She grinned as I gestured her forward. I'm Uzumaki Kushina and my brother and I are going to be the strongest ninja in the village. She declared loudly. Oh really? A boy in the front row sneered. Well, you're just a little baby who has to hold her big brother's hand. I barely managed to grab her around the waist before her temper led to broken teeth and bloody noses. Thankfully, her temper burned out fast and I managed to drag her to a seat towards the center of the room and sat her down between me and the kid with bright blonde hair and blue eyes. He wouldn't pick a fight with Kushina. Hopefully, she wouldn't feel the need to fight with him either. He bent over his notepad. A moment later he slid a note over to Kushina. She read it, smirked, and passed it on to me. Equals I'm Namike's Minato. Good job pulling one over on the teacher. So what's your name? I slipped the page under the desk as the teacher dropped a folder of loose paper for notes and assignments, a textbook thicker than my thigh, and two pencils in front of us. I took one pencil and scribbled my response in broken hiragana. Hashtag I'm not a fountain to regurgitate information on command. If you want my name, find it yourself. I smirked to myself. I covertly slid the paper to Kushina, who passed it straight to Minato. When he handed it back, Kushina read the answer and scribbled down her own two cents before sending it back to him. I was curious, but not enough to look over her shoulder. At least the real Kichiro was literate and I had inherited that skill from him, as well as language, or I'd be in some trouble. The note landed by my elbow and I scanned it. Equals is that a challenge? Plus you can bet your life it is. Kushina responded. Equals accepted. Minato finished and the note landed under my elbow. Hashtag Kushina and I didn't make lunches this morning, so we were going to go the next street over and get something from the market. Want to come? Uzumaki the older. Please pay attention. Sir? I was paying attention. You were asking the class to pass yesterday's arithmetic homework to the person on the inside row. I responded as Minato's homework landed in front of me. I held it up as proof I was following directions before collecting the papers handed up to me, put Minato's on top, and handed the stack forward. 
kindly do not distract your classmates. I opened my mouth to argue, but Kushina kicked me. I snapped my jaw shut as the mathematics lesson began. It was simple algebra, but something I felt Kushina would need serious help with later if her confused expression was any indication. Minato seemed to be bored, as if it was already far below his level. Frankly, I didn't give a damn about school, I could pick up the information easily and I doubted the grades mattered in the long run. Minato scribbled something back and the note landed in my lap. Sounds like fun. I tucked the note into my pocket and passed the assignment the teacher dropped in front of me down the row. Lunch with Minato went as well as a lunch with two six-year-olds could go. Both seemed to enjoy the sport of seeing how far they could push the other's buttons. For the most part, I let them antagonize each other over ramen, which both suggested the moment I asked. I wasn't surprised. What did surprise me was when Sakumo sat down on my other side looking quite worn out and ordered food. Hello, Sakumo, I muttered to him out of the corner of my mouth. He slapped the back of my head. I snorted and poked at my ramen. The Tooth Fairy? He asked. I've never heard of it. Probably never would have if you hadn't eavesdropped. Why would a fairy pay for a tooth? They make fairy dust out of baby teeth. If they wanted fairy dust, why wouldn't they just kill the kids and collect it faster, or just take the teeth to begin with? First, that's sick. Second, I glanced at Kushina, but she was in the middle of a wrestling match with Minato, and losing horribly. It's just a story for kids, it doesn't really have to make sense. The real world isn't that pretty. Well, the real world sucks. Might as well give the kids some happy memories to carry them through the rest of their shitty lives. Sakumo shrugged and pressed a coin into my hand. Sounds like a decent plan. Thanks, I tucked it into my pocket. I was thinking about what you told me. You would have to be an idiot not to. That earned me another smack. I half wished Kushina saw it so she could tear into the man and I could get some satisfaction out of indirect retaliation. You said you would fight like hell to keep people alive. I did. I was just making sure. Do you have any plan for the future? I don't want to be a shinobi. You don't have a choice, kid. I'm not a fighter. You're still a kid. I won't kill. Then you'll be killed. Then I will die. A bowl was placed in front of Sakumo. He started his meal before continuing the conversation. Do I need to add suicidal to your psych evaluation? An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind just as death only leads to more death. There was another break in the conversation, during which the two kids struggled over a dull practice kunai. Have you ever thought of being a medic? Sakumo asked suddenly. There's a war coming, several wars, and medics are the first targets. I opened my mouth to continue the argument when I considered a potential course of action. I have an idea, but you might not like it. Sakumo's chopsticks froze halfway to his mouth. I probably won't kid, but tell me anyways. Medics of opposing teams are the first targets in fights, right? Yes, you said. Well, tactically speaking, with less people being healed, there will be less enemies to fight, right? That's generally how it works. Targeting another team's medic decreases the team's chances of returning alive, whether it be from slowing down due to injury, the loss of a teammate, or a combination of the two. Most solo operatives know at least fundamental Irio Ninjutsu. What if medics weren't targeted at all? If you think that anything like that could ever happen, kid, you're kidding yourself. No, I'm not. For the most part in my world, doctors and nurses serve anyone and everyone who needs help, regardless of race, country, and religion. Sorry, kid, but that can't happen here. Why not? Hypothetically, say you manage to get everyone to agree with this and all medics are neutral. How would they get to the people they need to help? Would they go with the teams? If so, what happens if the medics team loses the fight? 
Their teammates are dead and now, because of their neutrality, they have to tend to the injuries of their opponents. I couldn't do something like that and I'm more open-minded than many shinobi. Now, a number of medics are being forced into this position. How does the opponent's team trust a medic who would naturally want revenge for their fallen comrades? Only the most pacifist Irionines would be able to treat an enemy, a majority would not. These medics would begin killing the very people they are supposed to treat. Congratulations, you just turned doctors into assassins. I stiffened and stared down at my half-eaten meal, appetite gone. Sakumo ruffled my hair. You're smart, kid, but you have decades of tradition and conditioning working against you. I don't want to fight, I don't want to kill, and I don't want to die, I told him. I tossed the pouch with money at Kushina and walked away. What did you say to my brother? Kushina demanded. He just has to come to terms with some things, Sakumo responded before I was out of earshot. Ten minutes later, I was perched at the top of a tree overlooking a playground and wondering if I could figure out the tree climbing exercise to distract myself from the real problem. The time I was due back at the academy came and went. Hours later, Sakumo appeared at the base of the tree. Your sister is waiting for you. She can take care of herself. She's six. Leave me alone. I can't do that, kid. Um, let me guess, orders. Exactly. With a few jumps, Sakumo sat on the branch below me. Go away. Talk to me, kid. Stop calling me kid. Dot. Then talk to me. I don't want to fight, I don't want to kill, and I don't want to die, I repeated myself. I don't want to be a shinobi. Sakumo stood and leaned against the branch I was sitting on. You don't have a choice. Well, from here it seems extremely easy to just fail out. I'm missing class already. You have your sister to take care of. She's not my sister, she's just a girl who's going to grow up and die at the hand of some psycho with a grudge. You don't mean that. I am 27 years old. I never had a sibling, I had a drunk for a mother and a father that was too obsessed with his military career to give a damn. I don't care to gain an obnoxious six-year-old as a little sister, especially if I'm going to be forced to screw up her life like mine was. So you'll abandon a little girl that looks up to you instead. I didn't choose her. You saved those kids, don't deny or downplay it. You saved them and they're your responsibility. I kicked at Sakumo's face. He caught my ankle. You told me I wasn't responsible. That was before I knew you had an adult's head on your shoulders. Asshole. His hand tightened around my ankle and he jerked me off the branch, dangling me upside down over the ground as if I weighed nothing. I started to struggle and kick at his hand. Sakumo stepped further out on the branch. It bent precariously and I knew it should not have been capable of supporting combined weight. I froze as the ground swayed beneath me. Lesson 1, land on your feet no matter what. Shit. You sadistic homicidal jackass. I snarled. Sakumo let go and I plummeted to the ground. I managed to twist in the air just enough to land on my side rather than my head. I rolled off my arm and looked down at it. My shoulder was up by my ear and it was certainly not supposed to be like that. Sakumo stood beside me and dragged me to my feet by my good arm. I groaned and almost immediately sank to my knees, holding my injured arm tightly to my chest. Asshole! I snarled. Belatedly, I realized that we weren't beside a playground, but in the center of what I guessed was a training field. A bad feeling coiled in my gut. What the hell, he backhanded me across the face. With a violent jerk, Sakumo shoved my arm back into the proper position. He grabbed my jaw and forced me to look him in the eye. Are you paying attention to me now? I have been paying attention to you. I snarled back. Then you'll have heard me when I told you that you will become a shinobi and it doesn't matter what you want. You will fight, you will kill, and hopefully you won't die. 
You're obviously not listening to me and you obviously don't have any respect because you don't seem to understand the fact. I knocked his hand away from my face and clutched at my throbbing shoulder. Sakumo grabbed my injured arm and twisted it. I clawed at his hand and screamed until he threw me to the ground and kicked the air out of my lungs. I flew a few feet away and rolled to a stop. Why should I respect a murderer or someone who takes what they want simply because they can? I did not even see him move before Sakumo grabbed the front of my shirt and slammed me into the ground. You may come from a world where everyone can talk out their problems, but you're not in that perfect universe anymore. The only way you can get what you want is to be stronger, faster, and more ruthless than whoever you face, kid, there's no way around it. Fight back. I won't. I screamed back in his face. I probably would have been better if Sakumo lost his temper or even got the slightest bit angry at me. Then, he would have ended up knocking me out at the very least. Instead, he seemed to have expected my reaction. I knew he was going to push me until I snapped. I knew it and I knew I could do absolutely nothing to stop it. Fight! Sakumo growled at me, throwing me back to the ground and kicking at my chest. I am fighting. I shouted back, rolling to my feet and retreating. I won't be you. Fight him. Attack him. The real Kichiro ordered. I ignored the kid as Sakumo knocked my breath away with a well-placed punch. I landed on my hands and knees, my head spinning with panic from the lack of oxygen. When I managed to ease in a breath, Sakumo kicked me to the side. His hand closed around my neck and the two of us crashed into the water. I clawed at his hand but we only seemed to sink deeper. I couldn't open my eyes underwater and I was quickly losing the tiny breath I managed before I was submerged. I kicked at where I guess Sakumo's head was but he only shoved me against the rocky stream bottom. Sharp rocks dug into my back. I tried to pull his hand away from my neck even as I twisted and struggled but I was getting weaker by the second and my limbs couldn't produce the force I demanded of them. Just when I thought I was about to lose consciousness, I landed back in the grass, I rolled onto my back and sucked in as much air as I could as I wiped the water from my face. Sakumo dropped to one knee beside me. When I regained some sort of normal breathing, I sat up and turned away from him. I know what you're trying to do. I'm not surprised. It's not going to work. Maybe. Go away. Sorry, kid. I stood up and walked away from him, clutching my stomach and staggering. I barely made it to the tree line before I was forced to stop with a groan of pain. Sakumo pressed something that crackled like paper against my chest and I didn't even bother to look at what it was. A moment later, something, I figured it was chakra, rushed through my body and soothed some of the pain. When I looked down, I recognized it as a seal, but he pulled it away before I could see anything more. I'll meet you here tomorrow at sunrise. Don't be late. He vanished. I had absolutely no intention of voluntarily seeing Sakumo ever again as I picked myself up from the ground and staggered towards the sounds of the city. Hopefully, I would be able to find my way back to my assigned apartment. It was nearly midnight before I found the apartment and managed to unlock the door with the key that hung around my neck like dog tags. I tried to be quiet, hoping that I could arrive unnoticed by Kushina. Unfortunately for me, she was waiting at the kitchen table working on something by the light of a flashlight since there wasn't any electric light in the building. Nisan. She cried and barreled into me the second I closed the door behind me. I patted her on the head awkwardly. I was worried about you. Where were you? Did something happen? Yes, something happened, I grunted to her. Do you think any sane person wants to come home in the middle of the night? Perhaps that was a bit harsher than it needed to be. I flopped down heavily on one of the two small mattresses in the general living area and dragged a blanket over my head. She brushed off my less than kind tone. Nisan, I have something you really should know. What is it? I asked, doing my best to feign interest. 
All I wanted to do was sleep and not wake up until noon the next day. There was no way I was getting up for the academy in the morning. Remember the clan ceiling library in Yuzu? Kichiro's memories appeared in the forefront of my mind. The so-called library wasn't very impressive, it only held a copy of every single seal the Uzumaki clan produced as well as all the instructions for sealing in general. Sort of, I responded. Well, the morning of the attack I was playing a prank on everyone. I had a bad feeling about what was about to come out of the little girl's mouth. So I sealed the entire contents of the library in this. She showed me a rather fat scroll I had seen her contemplating several times in the past week. I was going to give it back as soon as they noticed it was missing, but then the attack came. She sat down on the mattress beside me. I don't know what to do now. Don't tell anyone about it. I answered without hesitation. Carry it with you at all times and never let any of it out of your reach. Memorize and learn as much of it as you can. Shouldn't I tell a ninja or the Hokage about it? It could help them. I heard one of the shinobi complaining that they had now lost all the knowledge of the Uzumaki clan and that it could be very bad. I sat up and looked her in the eye, not feeling the slightest bit of kindness towards Kanoha. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, one of the founders of this village turned against it. He managed to summon a creature called the Kyubi against his will to murder the other founder and destroy the village he helped create. To stop the creature's rampage and subsequent anger at being forced to act, the Uzumaki princess, who was married to the founder who did not betray what he built, was forced to use her talent with those seals to seal away the Kyubi inside of herself. She's still alive, but she's getting old, so eventually the Kyubi, who didn't have a choice in any of this, is going to be resealed into someone else. Only people of the Uzumaki in conjunction with their seals can safely contain the Kyubi, the most powerful of his kind, inside of themselves. If you give those seals to the village, they will use them to keep sealing away the Kyubi and his brethren, sentencing the creatures to confinement and torture and the people they are sealed within to being hated and feared. What make you so certain? She asked. It wasn't a challenge, she obviously believed me and clutched the seals to her chest. You remember the story of Uzumaki Mido? I asked her as the Kichiro kid inside me pushed memories of the orphanage to the forefront of my mind. It was distracting, but at least he volunteered something of use and I didn't have to make an active effort to ignore the kid's annoying commentary. Of course. She's a hero. Yeah, well look at the story from the QB's perspective. Both sides were mean to him because of things he couldn't control. Is she so much of a hero now? Kushina's eyes went wide with horror as she shook her head. I didn't think so. At the righteous anger filling her expression, I decided to do a tiny bit of damage control. We were stuck in the village after all and I had enough of a conscience not to make it harder on her than it already would be. Don't tell anyone or let anyone know in any way that you know about any of this. I know you can learn the seals and use them properly, but I don't trust anyone else to. At least not yet. It'll be your secret Kunoichi skill, okay? She beamed, but it quickly faded. You said only the Uzumaki can hold the QB inside of them. Miyosama is getting old and she's going to have to seal it inside one of us orphans because we're the only Uzumaki left. Damn, she was smarter than I thought. Yes, she will, I responded patiently. Who is it going to be? She chewed on her finger and drew her knees to her chest. I saw no reason to give her a nice, comforting falsehood. It will be one of us. The other children aren't strong enough, I heard the Tsunade woman say as much. A second later I had a six-year-old girl clinging to my chest and crying. As I thought about it, I realized I could at least do something to stop a tragic future. I promise they won't seal the QB inside of you, okay? I promise. You'll get to determine if you want people scared of you and it will be your actions and decisions that determine whether you're loved or hated by people, not someone else's. I promise. She smiled slightly. 
the joys of children and not understanding that someone else would end up with the QB sealed in their gut. At least I wouldn't let it be me either. Ow, Kushina, not so tight. I gasped as her arms tightened around some of the poorly healed bruises. What happened? She demanded, concerned and lifting my shirt before I could push her away. Who did this to you? Sakumo, I spat out the name. If you see him, avoid him. I will, she promised. I can fix the bruises, if you want. How? I snapped out scathingly. I've already started learning stuff from the library when you haven't been looking. I got the idea when I couldn't help the other kids on the boat so I started learning healing seals. Who would have thought? Little Kushina was a genius at seals. I can fix bruises, some broken bones, scrapes, and something called dislocation, but not much more. There were lots of pens and special ink and extra paper in the library when I sealed everything. That was damn convenient. Knock yourself out, I told her as she dashed to the table and grabbed a stack of something. Honestly, I half hoped she would blow me up so I wouldn't have to deal with anything else. Unfortunately, I knew the girl was too good at sealing. Um, use the seal for dislocation on my shoulder, I'm going to sleep. Wait a minute. Take off your shirt first so I can see where to put the seals. I did as she asked before turning away. You were limping when you came in, let me see. I bit back an annoyed remark and pulled up my pant leg so she could see the bruise blossoming across the outside of my ankle and then the second bruise covering my knee. I didn't give a rat's fart about what she planned on doing, I just let the exhaustion dragging at my ill-fitting body take over. Chapter 3 Generally, I found mornings less than pleasant. Waking up before dawn to exchange Kushina's baby tooth for the coin Sakumo gave me quickly ruined it. I flopped back into bed afterwards. When the sun rose, nothing changed that fact. Kushina woke up and made a clumsy breakfast for herself, leaving me lying mostly asleep on my bed. I was used to being woken by people making breakfast, in my old apartment, the neighbor's kitchen was on the other side of a rather thin wall and they generally were up before five. My bed was right beside that wall. This morning wasn't the slightest bit normal or pleasant. Nisan, I'm going to the academy, are you coming? Kushina asked softly as she crouched beside my bed. No, just go. Don't forget the scroll. Are you feeling better? Much better, just sore and exhausted. Now leave. Okay. She seemed a bit hurt by my dismissal, but left anyways. Less than a minute later, a little girl's scream drove a knife into my head. I was out of my bed and pulling on my shirt while running to the door before the girl's lungs ran out of air. Kichiro was informing me in a frantic voice that it was Kushina's scream and urging me to help. On the steps between the second and third floors, Sakumo held Kushina by the arm. She clung to the scroll in one hand. Let her go. I snarled at him. She has nothing to do with this. We agreed to meet at sunrise, he stated. You ordered me to. I ignored you, I clarified. What could you possibly gain from that? He asked, smirking. His grip loosened enough for Kushina to jerk away and run up to bury her face in my shoulder. Satisfaction, I hissed as him, but tensed as he took a step up. And that gets you what? He took three more steps up. I twisted in Kushina's grip and used chakra to enhance my strength before picking her up, climbing onto the safety rail, and leaping across the street in one motion. I barely managed to land on my feet. Run, I growled at her. She didn't even hesitate before bolting towards the academy. The streets weren't busy, but there were enough people that someone should have noticed a shinobi stalking towards me with a knife out. Jinjutsu, I spat out at him as he appeared in front of me. You're a coward. You're too scared of what people would think if they saw you tormenting a kid. Sakumo ignored me. I see you've learned the first lesson, always land on your feet. Shit. Now for lesson two, 
know when to defy expectations and when to fulfill them. Shit. Sakumo's hand closed around my wrist and the next thing I knew we were back at the training ground. His hands flipped through hand seals and he vanished. It only took me a second to recognize it as a Jinjutsu. Unfortunately, I had no idea how to dispel one. There wasn't a lot that could scare me. I was too good at rationalizing my fear, turning it into something that didn't matter. It didn't help Sakumo any that I did have a not-so-insignificant death wish. I liked to be contrary, just to be contrary. It didn't help me that I wasn't sure exactly how to be contrary in this instance. Before anything could happen, I closed my eyes and covered my ears so that whatever terrors appeared would have less of an effect. Obviously, Sakumo wouldn't kill me or seriously injure me, it would completely defeat his purpose. He probably wouldn't drive me insane, which was a small comfort. I thought back to when Kushina taught me to access my chakra. It was surprisingly easy, especially when I compared the feel of my former body to Kichiro's. Someone else's chakra was enveloping mine, especially around my eyes and ears. I made a mental note to figure out exactly how big of a role chakra played in this world. My next problem was whether to break the illusion. The longer I contemplated the problem, the more irritating Sakumo's chakra became. I decided to experiment instead. That had to be decidedly not on the list of expected behaviors. I started with my ears, hoping I didn't make myself deaf in the process. Slowly, I worked visualizing the chakra fueling my hearing into my hands. To my surprise, I was somewhat successful. Sakumo's chakra fueling the auditory jinjutsu shifted onto my hands. At the same time, I lost all sense of sound. Anyone can cover their ears and block out most of the noise, but there's always vibrations that make it through. Hell, the thrum of blood beneath the skin makes up most of the noise that drowns out whatever is trying to be blocked out. I slowly pulled my hands away from my ears. The loss of sound quickly equated to a loss of balance, and I tipped sideways. Thankfully, the weight shifting in my legs allowed me time to catch myself so I didn't fall like a fell tree. My hands couldn't hear anything, so I effectively neutralized that portion of the jinjutsu. I didn't dare try the same with my eyes until I knew I didn't just completely blow out my hearing. I broke, disrupted, and scrambled the threads of Sakumo's chakra around me then released control over my chakra. To my embarrassment, the rush of chakra back into my head knocked me out. When I finally regained consciousness, I didn't immediately pick myself up. That was a dangerous move, kid. Probably up there with blindfolded biju fighting. Sakumo told me. I sat up and finally opened my eyes. A few feet away, Sakumo sat whittling a stick into what appeared to be a sunbon. He was nearly done and the sun was at high noon. My stomach twisted painfully. He tossed me a small bento box and chopsticks. I'm not hungry, I responded and shoved it away. My stomach growled painfully. Not hungry enough to set aside your pride, anyways. If you're not going to eat it, throw it away. We're done for today. Meet me here tomorrow at sunrise. I scowled at him, but he didn't even look back as he walked away. When I felt like he was gone, I tucked the bento under one arm and marched away from the training field. I made it to the academy just in time for it to end. Kushina was one of the last ones out, with Minato at her side. I waited on a very familiar swing, tapping impatiently. They split off after a quick goodbye and Kushina made a beeline for me. Are you okay, Nisan? She asked, worried. I'm fine. I brought you something. I handed the bento and chopsticks to her. Hataki-san didn't beat you up again, did he? No, I'm perfectly healthy now. There's no need for you to worry. But I am worried. You're being weird and sad and I don't like it. I threw an arm around her shoulders. You have more interesting things to think about, right, Kushina? Why don't you call me Kushina-chan anymore? Um, I guess I just got hit in the head a little too hard. 
I don't like it when you call me just Kushinada. I'm, um, sorry. I wasn't. The girl wasn't my sister. She's my sister, so you will call her whatever she wants you to. Shut up. Kushina and I started to walk back to our apartment and I ignored the raging of a seven-year-old in my head and the sounds of Kushina shoveling the bento into her mouth. When we got there, I absently made the first microwavable dish I could lay my hands on while Kushina worked on homework. Sensei told Minato that you weren't going to continue in the academy, is that true? I think so, I answered mutinously. Do you want to be a shinobi? No, but I have to. Why don't you want to? Because I don't want to kill people. But shinobi only kill bad people. They're heroes, you're a hero, why don't you want to be a bigger hero? Shinobi kill whomever they are paid to. I told her as I picked up my food. And I never wanted to be a hero. Part of the job description is generally, um, martyrdom. What's that? It means dying for what you believe in. Oh. Well, I'm going to be such a great kunoichi that I won't die. You do that. I'm sure you can, but first you have to do your homework. You're going to be an awesome shinobi and you're not even going to the academy or doing homework. Because I'm too smart and have to be brainwashed and conditioned to kill instead, I muttered to myself. What was that? Um, I already know mostly all of the academy stuff you're learning. Prove it. Fine. Finish your homework and you can quiz me. In the meantime, can you unseal the beginner section of our little library for me to read? Kushina unsealed the very first primer labeled Step 1 of Becoming the Best Seal Master Ever and I snorted at the brazen title before opening it. Three hours later, Kushina finished her homework and started to ask me every single question on it. To my surprise as much as hers, I managed to get all the answers correct, though I didn't particularly approve of the phrasing of the questions. For example, the very first one for the basic algebra section was it takes two kunai or three shuriken to kill a target. You have 16 kunai and 24 shuriken. How many targets can you kill? After the quiz session was over, I turned back to the ceiling primer and Kushina latched onto a seal I was sure was supposed to be far beyond her comprehension. Chapter 4 The next day, I tried something different. I woke up a little more than an hour before sunrise and dragged Kushina out of bed. A half hour later, we were perched in the tree outside the academy, waiting for the place to open. I was bored and struggling to read the hiragana from the huge textbook issued on the first day and enjoying the manipulation present in nearly every sentence. Kushina kept sending me odd looks when I started laughing at how insulting the textbook was to the intelligence of future shinobi. Besides the manipulation, there was no underneath the underneath of the book. Either that or I was just an idiot, which I sincerely doubted. An hour before the academy was set to begin, Kushina met Minato at some extra lesson the two had apparently agreed to attend together. I sunk deep into the tree and watched as Minato carefully showed Kushina how to throw a kunai. I wasn't particularly surprised they hit it off so quickly. When the academy bell rang, I was feeling a bit smug at having thus far avoided Sakumo for the day. I knew he'd find me eventually, he was a jonin, but for now I was enjoying the small victory. Even if I was a bit disturbed by the game we were playing. Bored, I wondered how easy it would be to learn tree walking without moving from my perch in the tree. Mostly, it consisted of me putting my hand or foot against it and yanking until I figured out how to make it stay. About an hour before lunch, I was experimenting with sticking different parts of my body to the tree and mentally scolding myself for playing with power I didn't need. I see you've kept yourself busy, Sakumo said from directly above me. I nearly lost my balance in surprise. Want to guess what today's lesson was? Shit. Lesson 3, How to Fight Back. Sakumo crouched horizontally on the main part of the tree, beside me. Shit. He won. We both knew it. I punched the tree in frustration. Mind telling me what we've learned these past few days? 
Sakumo asked, smiling. I scowled back. Lesson 1, always land on your feet. Lesson 2, um, defying and fulfilling expectations. Lesson 3, fight back. Translation, live or survive, think and act. Taijutsu, Jinjutsu, and Ninjutsu. I turned away from him. Now what was the message I wanted you to get out of it? Hell if I know. Kichiro, Sakuma warned. Fine. You had to beat me up, terrify a little girl, and make me paranoid as hell to tell me that fighting doesn't equal murder. Very good. Brutalization, brainwashing, and conditioning. What do you mean? In my world, it is a traditional military practice to turn civilians into soldiers. Brutalization is the process that causes them to function with an almost pack mentality, it's generally called basic training. Brainwashing is when they tell them what their job is and that they're going to do it and they're not going to fail. Conditioning is where they're taught to do their job. And you thought I was going to follow a tradition I've never heard of. Yes. There was a tiny flaw in my conclusion, laugh it up. In my defense, you are following it because it's still psychology. I'm not laughing because you're right. But you're too fact and reason oriented to stand by what you think when it doesn't have the most solid foundation. I grunted an unintelligible response. I have something for you, kid. Stop calling me kid. Sakumo sat down on the branch beside me. Not all shinobi are made to be assassins or to fight in the front lines. There's no shame in it. Some kids see through the brainwashing in the academy. You did in a heartbeat if watching you read that textbook was any indication. Those that still want to become shinobi are offered apprenticeships. That's what I'm offering you now. Do you accept? I thought about it for a long time. What's my other option? Sakumo's face turned impassive in answer. One way or another, you will become a loyal shinobi and there are ways to ensure it. I swallowed. I'll take the apprenticeship, so long as you're the person I'm apprenticed to. Not very keen to expand your social circle? Um, I wouldn't mind that, but I'm not going to deal with someone I can't give hell to. Fair enough, that's why I brought you these. Sakumo held two sturdy wooden sticks out in front of me. I took them warily, rolling them in my hands. What are they? Sticks. I can see that. Sakumo laughed. You don't want to kill so I found a way that you don't have to. A few strong hits with a sturdy stick can be just as effective as a blade. And much less deadly. Exactly. You don't have to worry about coming home from missions smelling like blood every time. Sakumo placed a thick book in my lap. Mentally, you're not built for hurting other people, kid. I'm sure you're perfectly capable, but just because I've convinced you now that learning to fight isn't inherently bad, it doesn't mean you'll remain convinced forever. I won't recommend you to work in the hospital every day, I don't think you have the patience for it. You'd make a great battlefield medic, kid, it's a role I know you'll like. The ends of the sticks had straps tied to them, so I slipped them around my wrist and held up the book. It had basically everything I needed to begin learning the theory behind medical ninjutsu, as well as how to learn it practically as well. He tapped the book. You'll be learning this on your own time, kid, but I'll let you practice occasionally when you're training with me. Now, will you meet me at the training ground for real tomorrow? He asked. At sunrise, I confirmed. But I'm going to be a few minutes late. It's the principle of the thing. He swung down from the tree. You'll go far, kid, once you learn to keep that tongue in your head where it belongs. Um, I'm not looking to go far. Don't get me wrong, I found seals to be extremely interesting, but unlike Kushina, I didn't have any innate genius to help me learn. She began healing with only a week of study, but learning sealing was like learning to read music or write in another alphabet. I knew how to learn it, I had taken music lessons and Latin in high school and I took two semesters of Mandarin while in the military. 
It wouldn't take me too long to learn the language of sealing, but I knew I'd never be very good in comparison to Kushina. Medical ninjutsu, however, would be almost entirely hands-on, which I could do. Sure, I had to memorize hundreds of bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, know exactly how the muscles and joints work together, and know exactly how the heart worked as well as every other organ and system, but most of that I had already learned in high school anatomy and physiology, so it wasn't particularly bothered by the refresher. It helped that Kichiro was extremely interested in it as well and we could fill in where the other may have forgotten. There was an entire section on how the brain worked, which Kichiro seemed especially interested in. I was as well, but in comparison to what I learned in high school, the current level of knowledge about the working of the brain was quite sparse, which frustrated us both. In the morning, Kichiro woke me up a half hour before sunrise. I ate breakfast and, on Kichiro's behalf, woke Kushina to tell her she didn't have to avoid Sakumo and that she had to be up soon for the academy. I made it to the training ground five minutes after sunrise. Through the center of the training ground was a rope tied between two trees. I froze when I saw it. You're learning balance first. By practicing my, um, slacklining skills? Slacklining? It's an odd sport from my world. Um, basically you do tricks on a stretchy tightrope. And you can do this? I could, but now I'm about half my size with a quarter of my strength. Sakumo gestured towards the line. You first. I want to see your tricks, old man. He snorted. Um, you're the one with white hair. You're going to regret that. Am I? I'm the one with nearly two decades of shinobi experience. Right, can I take the old man comment back? We'll see. Come here. Sakumo tossed all his live weapons in a pile just out of falling distance of the rope and leapt on. The rope sunk about a foot under his weight. We're not starting katas just yet. It's much easier to get a lucky with a blade, major veins and arteries are never far beneath the surface of the skin. With sticks, you have to always assume you're at the disadvantage because they won't bleed your opponent dry before you. Right now, you're still a kid, that means you can't rely on your reach or strength to win you anything. You have to be faster, stronger, and more skilled than your opponent. All of that begins with your balance. I nodded once and stepped up onto the rope. Sakumo grasped my forearm to steady me as he jumped down. The line is loose enough to allow you to move freely, but not so loose that losing your balance is dangerous, for now. Move around, jump a little, get a feel for where your center of gravity is. I did just that. I started by walking a few steps in both directions. After a second of contemplation, I jumped down and stripped off my civilian shoes. I leapt back on and as I started to get a feel for the rope, I jumped to test my strength and balance. Carefully, Sakuma watched. From the way he jerked at my more sudden movements, he was probably worried I was going to hurt myself when Kichiro's body failed in way my old body wouldn't. He tensed as I jumped almost three feet in the air and landed with the rope diagonally across my back. I intended to let the tension in the rope drive me upright like a trampoline, but Kichiro didn't have my sense of balance and I tumbled off the rope and into the grass. Sakumo crouched to help me up. It's been a while since I've seen somebody fall like that on purpose. Can you refocus on the task at hand, please? Just the one trick, then I'll focus, I promised. He sighed, but gestured for me to try again. This time, I managed to land on my feet, even if I missed the rope. Sakumo grasped my forearm as we both jumped back onto the rope. When we regained our balance, he released me. From nowhere, Sakumo produced an old, worn bakken. He held it perpendicular to the line we stood on. Your balance may not matter as much when you're attacked head-on. He shoved me backwards for emphasis and I barely managed to avoid falling off. But when I attack you from another direction your weight and size work against you. He swung the bakken at my shoulder and all but threw me off the line. 
I tumbled head over heels and stopped flat on my face. I felt one of my teeth loosen at the impact. You could have just said so. You didn't have to throw me off. I protested, then spat blood. True, but this way you'll remember it and hopefully I'm discouraging stupid stunts before they're attempted. Or maybe just, um, encouraging them. I muttered under my breath. I heard that. Stupid shinobi with stupid crazy good hearing. That comment earned me a slap on the back of my head. I wasn't sure exactly how Sakumo managed it from five feet away, but I decided not to question it as I stepped back onto the rope while he jumped off and made two shadow clones. The rest of the day was spent catching and returning water balloons without breaking them, knocking aside rubber balls and dodging shot put. There seemed to be no telling the difference, until I realized that Sakumo threw them with different strengths and I had to watch him, not the evil little spheres of trickery. Suffice to say, I wasn't happy when I thought the nice, innocent rubber ball turned out to be a solid metal shot put that nearly broke my arm. For the first few hours, I felt like it was just luck of the draw, though I was forced into several fancy maneuvers to avoid the shot put. At around noon, Sakumo dispersed the clones and held out a bento for me. I thought the after-lunch exercise was straightforward, climb a tree without your feet. With my old body, I could probably do it just fine, even without chakra. With Kichiro's, it was much more difficult. For extremely short periods at a time, I could use chakra to strengthen my muscles and attach myself to the tree, but it never lasted long. I spent more time falling than climbing over the next hour. About a quarter of the time I landed on my feet and before my chakra levels dropped to dangerous levels, Sakumo told me to buzz off and do my own thing that didn't use chakra. Kushina and I repeated our routine from the night before. Chapter 5 Sakumo and I didn't take much longer to fall into a routine. Five days a week, a few minutes after sunrise, we would meet on the training ground. For the first few weeks, the first three hours of the day alternated between several different exercises to help with balance and core strength. The ones involving what he called rope walking and I insisted with slacklining were my favorite, simply because it reminded me of the days with some of my friends in the army when we would mess around and show off on the weekends. Also, the fact that Sakumo and I had a similar sense of humor often made me forget exactly what I was training to do. The next few hours focused almost entirely on building speed, reflexes, and flexibility. After lunch, I worked on chakra control. On days he wasn't training me, I guessed that Sakumo took missions, but no matter how innocently or covertly I asked, I couldn't confirm the thought. I wasn't curious enough to stalk him just yet, but occasionally I would catch a glimpse of a bandage under his collar or beneath his gloves, and if I paid attention, I would notice the occasional stiff movements. Either way, while Sakumo was on missions, I spent the days practicing medical ninjutsu or studying fuinjutsu. Tsunade had set up a section of the hospital for medics in training to work under the supervision of a retired medic mean. I was very obviously the youngest person there. Most medics didn't begin training until they were at least chunin, simply because few jinin or academy students had both the chakra capacity and the control necessary to be a medic in the first place. Since I was an Uzumaki, I had the chakra I needed and the daily practice improved my control by leaps and bounds. I was also the only boy, which surprised me. In fact, I found a total of three male doctors in the entire village. They were all civilians. By the end of the first six months of this routine, I found I had learned nothing about Sakumo's life. Sure, I figured I knew his personality quite well, but I had no idea who his friends were, what his hobbies were, besides training me, or what kind of food he liked. At the same time, he added katas from several styles of stick fighting he planned on teaching me how to throw kanai, shuriken, and senban, turn practically anything into a defensive weapon into the training regime, as well as other shinobi skills such as detecting and dispelling jinjutsu, which he was liable to hit me with at any point in the day, making and avoiding traps, which were set up all over the training ground, surveillance, the basics of infiltration, and survival. 
Before, I had time to make dinner with Kushina, occasionally with Minato as well, and listen to her lectures of what she learned in the academy. After the rest was added to my training, she spent the afternoon with the blonde and several others training, we ate takeout four days a week, and stayed up until midnight while Kushina finished her nightly review and I studied ceiling by the light of the flashlight dangling from a hole we made in the ceiling. We both worked on memorizing as much of our clan's history and legal procedures and worked to keep alive as much of the clan as possible, even if it was only the skeleton of its former glory. By the end of my first year in Konoha, Sakumo still hadn't taught me any ninjutsu or jinjutsu, besides giving me ideas of which medical jutsu to learn next, and hadn't even started teaching me to apply what I knew about taijutsu in an actual fight. As far as I could tell, Kushina's first year in Kanoa went great. Her friendship with Minato, the class genius, had deterred most of the bullying I remembered she had to deal with in canon, and she had taken to pulling the Big Brother card whenever she didn't feel like dealing with it herself. The entire academy knew that Uzumaki Kushina's older brother was an apprentice to the reasonably well-known jonin, Hataki Sakumo, and that deterred the rest of the bullies. The fact that Kushina was the second best in the class helped as well, though it made her a social pariah to the other girls because their crush, Minato, paid more attention to her than the rest of them, who specifically tried to get his attention in Kushina, the foreign girl who popped out of nowhere, had his attention from the moment she stepped into the room with tangled hair, ragged clothes, and a missing tooth, intent on beating up whomever irked her. I, on the other hand, had my own problems to worry about. I was never a very social person. I tended to make a small circle of friends and rarely ventured outside of the social sphere. I didn't have the patience for mindless conversation, which made my time working in the training section of the hospital as tedious as it was interesting and useful. The fact I was working with girls didn't bother me as much as the fact that most of them saw me as little more than a cute wannabe medic boy there for them to hug whenever they were in a ridiculously good mood or order about on gopher work when they were in a bad mood. I lost my temper several times when their bad mood coincided with mine and it turned into a rather impressive shouting match between me and several girls at once. Intellectually, I was just as good as them. My chakra reserves were a bit smaller and my control a fair bit below theirs, but still passable. I could do my job just as well as them, even better than them when it was put in the context of my age and how long I'd spent practicing. It grated on my nerves when they ignored that bit in favor of the tiny detail that I wasn't even a shinobi yet. Fortunately, the supervisor let me tell them off, then separated us before the girls could have their say. The only reason I got away with telling them off was because the shinobi patients found it amusing and fewer people skipped out of treatment when I was there, hoping to see something degenerate into a fight. It gave me immense satisfaction when I managed to graduate the program in half the time before many of the girls who had begun before me. At that point, Sakumo approached me about becoming a shinobi and joining a jinin team. I was tempted, the routine that we had settled into was a bit boring, but in the end, I realized that the closest I had ever come to a physical fight in this world was when I leapt into the boat to get away from the Kiri shinobi attacking Yuzushio Bikure, and I knew I wasn't anywhere near ready. Shortly after that, Sakumo started to teach me how to apply the hundreds of kata I had learned with the sticks, my fists, and Sakumo's bakken. When I could defend against him paying just enough attention to not put me in the hospital, he started to arrange for me to spar once or twice a week with the academy class set to graduate that year. After a few false starts and a little bit of ridicule while I got over my aversion to soundly beating little kids, I was easily the best in the class, even though they were all a year older than me. Over the next year, Kushina lost five teeth and my front four teeth grew in while the next four had come out. I remembered losing my baby teeth the first time and I had no desire to undergo it a second time. Honestly, the second time was much worse. The gaps in my teeth annoyed me just as much as actually having a loose tooth. I suffered through one of them wiggling for a week straight. The next one that got loose was yanked out the second it was no longer useful for chewing. That incident taught me that it was better to let my gums heal themselves than try and heal them with irio ninjutsu. 
I ripped the tooth out one of the days Tsunade was assessing me and she laughed herself to tears when I started snarling at my bleeding mouth and how Irio Ninjutsu sucked at dentistry. Shortly after Kichiro's ninth birthday and a week after I solidified my position as a better fighter than any of the squirts, Suna declared war on Konoha for financial reasons. Kumo followed suit by declaring war on Kiri. Kiri offered an alliance with Konoha, who rejected it because of what happened in Yuzu. IWA declared war on Konoha and Kumo at the same time Suna declared war on IWA while making an alliance with Kiri, who declared war on Konoha shortly after. I had no idea why everything exploded at once, but I knew things were about to get bad fast. Three weeks later, any academy student fit enough to run messages and smart enough to hold their own in a fight was rushed through to graduation. That included Minato and Kushina. A week before their graduation, Sakumo informed me that I didn't have a choice but to take the exam with them, and until the exam was to take place I would be attending Tsunade's five-day class on the role medics would play in the war, then join Sakumo's team as their medic. Somewhere in that was a veiled threat that if I failed, I would be placed in the root program. I followed orders, but avoided him for the entire week. The academy exam was frankly a joke in comparison to the training I underwent with Sakumo. There was a mediocre obstacle course during which at a random point a Jinjutsu was placed for us to dispel. We had to be able to critically hit four moving targets with only four of our choice throwing weapons. We were placed in a Taijutsu match with one of the Chunin Proctors and had to survive for five minutes, then were ordered to perform the three basic academy jutsu as well as one other. I was too lazy to go through all the hand seals for one of the several defensive jutsu Sakumo had taught me, so I just broke my little finger and healed it without any seals. It impressed the proctors and I exempted the written portion of the test, because they figured that if I had the know-how for medical jutsu, it was pointless to have me sit through an exam I'd probably ace without trying. I was only a minute late to Tsunade's last class, but when she saw the brand new Hitai 8 and my team assignment clutched in my fist, she let it slide with a disapproving scowl. I scowled back on principle. Straight face. Whenever a new teammate joined an active team, there was a required two-week acclimation period. As such, I was scheduled to spend my first two weeks as a Jinin with Sakumo and his three teammates. My very first scheduled mission was a B-rank, which frankly scared the hell out of me. I was slightly comforted by the fact that Sakumo and another of his teammates were full Jonin, another was a Tokabetsu Jonin and the last one was a Chunin. Our first meeting was somewhat interesting. I was five minutes late to our meeting because Tsunade had pulled me aside after the last field medic class to tell me that while my shenanigans in the training program were entertaining, I was now a shinobi and if she heard even a rumor of me breaking any of her medic mean rules she would pull me off the field and stick me in the recovery ward of the hospital until I learned my lesson. I retorted that she didn't have the authority because all medics with the slightest potential, no matter what rank, in battlefield positions were being discharged no matter what. I left before she could argue. You're late. Sakumo snapped as I dashed onto the field. Tsunade thinks I'm a rule breaker so she felt the need to threaten me, I retorted, earning myself a slap on the back of my head. You are a rule breaker, kid, and a troublemaker. If you told her off for being right. I snorted, earning myself another hit. He's six. One of my new teammates exclaimed in disgust. We can't afford dead weight. I'm nine. I retorted. Sakumo clamped a hand over my mouth before I could add an insult to the statement. He's been apprenticed to me for nearly two years, he won't be a dead weight. We need a medic on our team and he's been certified for over six months even though he only got off his ass and took the genin exam today. Now, with a medic on our team, we can take higher rank missions more often. There is a new policy on medics. They're not supposed to fight unless it's an absolute last resort. As our medic, we defend him. That means he's going to be the one carrying the mission scroll, maps, and any other vital mission supplies, not me. At this, I managed to slip out of Sakumo's grip. Now, as a medic, even though he's a Jinin, 
he only answers to me, Tsunade, and the Hokage, so haze him at your own risk, because Tsunade doesn't like her medics being harassed and we all know the Hokage almost always lets her have her way. Everyone sit down, we're doing introductions, in Azuka, you start. We all sat in a circle of the training ground and a man with spiky black hair scowled as he introduced himself. I'm Inazuka Jiro, full jonin. My partner is Takumi, also a jonin. On mission, he's called Dog, no exceptions. He whistled once and a huge dog bounded out of the trees. The creature was covered with thick, midnight black fur and nearly twice my size. We specialize in my clan techniques, close combat, and ninjutsu. The dog sniffed at my face and I quickly scratched behind his ear to distract him when he covered half my face with slobber in a single lick. Unfortunately, it only excited the creature and he knocked me backwards to better down me in slobber. I liked dogs, they were smart, fun to wrestle with, but I preferred the ones that did not resort to licking to communicate their approval of an individual. The dog had more chakra than me and almost completely obscured mine as he lay down on top of me. I smirked as I fended off Takumi's enthusiastic greeting and performed a silent substitution with Jiro. Takumi barked happily the second the switch was complete and Jiro shouted indignantly. The group laughed good-naturedly. My smirk turned immediately into a scowl when I saw Sakumo holding out a hand to the other two teammates who handed over a sizable sum of money. What was the bet over? I demanded. That you would prank Inazuka within five minutes of meeting the team, Sakumo answered. They bet you couldn't pull it off. You should have told me and I would have thought up something more original. Sakumo shrugged and slapped the lot into my hand. That was original enough for me. Here's part of what I owe you. How did a kid win a bet against you, Hataki? One of the others, who looked like a textbook Nara, asked. He bet he could beat up one of the Sandame students. The hell, Hataki? You could have gotten the kid killed. The person to my right barked. He had light brown hair that wisped across his face, blurring his features. The bet was that I could have one of the Sandame students beaten up by the end of the day, I clarified as I tucked the money into my short, dark green, sleeveless kimono, which looked like a male version of Kushina's canon outfit from when she was a jinnin. I crossed my legs, which were covered by dark green shinobi pants and adjusted the strap of my black shinobi sandals. So, I told Tsunade that I overheard that Orochimaru had managed to calculate her bra size and was bragging to Jiraiya, so Jiraiya stole one of her bras to try and prove Orochimaru had miscalculated and let the entire thing play out. Tsunade beat up both of them and neither saw it coming. She knew I was lying, but she was mad at them for something else and the Sandame had forbidden her from beating the two of them up for it, so she used the excuse I gave her. I got the equivalent of my monthly orphan stipend off him and a week off from Tsunade. Win-win for me. You're a little cheat. Jiro snapped as Takumi finally rolled off him. The effect of his anger was all but neutralized by the fact he was scratching the dog's belly and covered with hair and slobber. I ain't winning if I ain't cheating. You're a bastard for training your apprentice like that, Hataki, the man to my right laughed. Hey! He came like that. Shimizu, introduce yourself next. The person to my right, who didn't seem to have a problem with insulting Sakumo, spoke. I'm Shimizu Arata. Tokabetsu Jonin. I specialize in intelligence, jinjutsu, and traps. Nara, you next. The last person on the team raised a hand. Nara Saburo, Chunin. Specialization in long-range combat. I find it unfair that the kid is exempted from dress code, Hataki. There isn't a dress code for Jinin, I argued. How about you introduce yourself, kid, before you start picking fights, Sakumo suggested. Uzumaki Kichiro, Jinin. I'm a medic, but no specialization yet. Why don't you introduce yourself as well, Sakumo? I asked pointedly. Hataki Sakumo, Jonin and team leader. 
no specialization. So your student is a disrespectful little cheat, Jiro amended his previous accusation. We have an agreement, Sakumo answered before launching into a lecture on the team formation and roles. We went deeper in depth about individual abilities and Sakumo outlined strategies in the dirt for the rest of the day. When the sun was about to set, Sakumo sent me home to meet Kushina just in time for when we agreed to meet. The second I landed, Minato slammed into me. Where's Kushina? He asked frantically. She said she'd meet me here an hour ago, but she hasn't showed and there's no note. We're on the same gin and team and she had forgotten something at the training field and said she'd meet me here but it's been an hour and when I went back to the field, she wasn't there and had left this. Minato shoved the scroll that contained the Uzumaki library into my hands. Shit. I did not expect her to be kidnapped this soon. If anything, I expected Kumo to kidnap me instead, since I made it clear, even to outsiders, that I did not agree with many of Kanoha's policies. In hindsight, I suppose it made sense. Kushina spent most of her time with Minato, who was just a Jinan, I just spent almost the entire day in the presence of Jonin, and frankly, I was a better ninja than her, no matter what my rank said. She'd never leave that behind, Kichiro. That's her special scroll. I think she's been kidnapped. Kichiro! Are you listening? I shoved the scroll into my kimono. Yes, I'm listening. You're probably right. The only reason she would leave this scroll behind would be if she was kidnapped. How long has she been gone? I wasn't sure Minato heard anything after I confirmed his fear. Minato! I snapped. How long has she been gone? Less than an hour. Right. I leapt up to my door and pulled out a scrap of paper from one of my pockets along with a pencil and shuriken. I scribbled assistance required. Kushina kidnapped, Kichiro and Minato in pursuit onto the paper in the standard Kanoa code, noted the time, pinned it to the door, tied one of my hairs around the shuriken, and leapt back down to Minato. Take me back to the training ground you last saw her at. I ordered. Minato didn't hesitate to grab my wrist and drag me there. It only took a moment for me to find a clump of her hair by the edge of the clearing. Shit! Sakumo never taught me to raise an alarm, I snarled at no one before turning to Minato. Come on, we're going after her, top speed and I'm taking full responsibility. You know the Inazuka tracking formation, right? Minato nodded. Good. Let's go. Just like that, we were off. I made sure to keep my cursing in my head for Minato's sake. Every time I saw one of Kushina's hairs, I dropped a few of my own on top of it to strengthen the trail. We followed it to a hole in the wall. I did my best to trip every security alarm I could see before we were through the wall. While the people who took Kushina hadn't left much of a trail, Minato and I made sure to leave as obvious of one that we could, not that anyone seemed to be following us, to my immense displeasure. The village was supposed to be at war. It was almost midnight when Minato started to fall behind. I stopped and motioned him over to me. Within a minute, I healed the aching soreness in his legs that slowed him down, and we were off again. I guessed it to be almost two in the morning when we finally caught a glimpse of Kushina. Minato and I stopped abruptly. I started to sign instructions to him, but he just looked confused. I signed them again and he shook his head. Right, Joan and normally taught their teams the signs and Minato hadn't learned yet. I grabbed his arm and dragged him out of earshot. Um, I'll jump in front of them and distract them. You neutralize the threat from behind, got it? Minato nodded once and I took off. In less than a minute, I landed just inside of a standard attack range and dramatically pulled my sticks from where they were secured to the small of my back. Give me back my sister. I demanded loudly. The last syllable of sister masked the sound of Minato knocking out the Jonin in the back and lowering him to the ground without a sound. Oh really, little boy, we could use another Uzumaki. How about you take her from us? 
He walked towards me, just as Kushina took out the second Jonin's knee with a vicious kick and Minato knocked him out before he could make a sound. I didn't wait for the Jonin to launch his attack, I leapt forward. He threw a kunai and everything seemed to slow as I twisted in midair to avoid the blade going straight into my heart. Just as I felt the blade press against my kimono, a giant hand closed around the handle while the other shoved me backwards and out of range of any stray attacks. I landed on my feet and crouched defensively as the new arrival turned to me. Sensei. Minato and Kushina cheered. I recognized Jiraiya in a heartbeat, but Sakumo had stressed the fact that I always needed to confirm identity when in the field. Easy, does it, kid, you alright? You're Hitaki's apprentice, right? Jiraiya tried to placate me. The fact he still had a kunai in his hand did not help. Confirm identity. I signed to him in the little bit of the Jonin sign language I knew from Sakumo. It looked like I was just readjusting my grip. Jiraiya didn't respond. It could have meant one of two things, first and most likely, Jiraiya thought I was just adjusting my grip since I was a Jinin and probably shouldn't know any of the Jonin signs. The second option, which I went with just to be safe, was that he was an extra member of the Kumo team. Kumo teams operate in standard groups of four. The entire academy knows I'm apprenticed to Ataki. Confirm identity. Jiraiya holstered his kunai and tapped his right thigh with four fingers, then all five digits, the current sign for a Kanoa Jonin. I responded by putting away my sticks and adjusting my hatai with my second finger and thumb, the sign for a Kanoa Jinin. Hataki's taught you well, kid, Jiraiya commented, straightening from his defensive crouch. But Kumo infiltration teams operate in teams of three, as do the abduction teams, I'm not an idiot. You could have just responded the first time, Jiraiya. You are extremely disrespectful for a puny, day old Jinin. I stuck my tongue out at him. No medic takes any special care to respect you in particular. I brushed past him to where Kushina was leaning heavily against Minato and holding her ribs. Tell Tsunade I said thanks for the week off. Jiraiya's face turned red. You're the squirt who? Yes, I am, I answered while I crouched and pressed a hand against Kushina's side. It took me almost ten minutes to heal the fractured ribs. When I finished and stood, Kushina hugged me tightly. After a second, she pulled Minato into the hug as well. I took the opportunity to use a bit of medical ninjutsu to check for any further injuries on them. I patted them both on the head and pulled away, turning to face Jiraiya with a question. I know you're supposed to be reporting in three and a half hours, kid, he stated firmly before I could say a word. And you may not go on ahead and try and make it. Kumo was after a Uzumaki. You're staying with me until we're back in the village. Minato and Kushina looked between us in confusion at the sudden tension. They may have missed the threat, but I got it. Minato and I were in trouble for leaving the village without permission. Well, at least I promised him I'd take responsibility. Better I get in trouble than the future Yandame to have a black spot on his record. Besides, it's not like I hadn't tried to draw attention to myself as I was leaving. I couldn't do a thing about it now, so I just picked up the smallest of the Kumo Nin by an arm and a leg, hefted him onto my back, and started marching back towards the village. Kushina leaned on Minato, Jiraiya hoisted the other two Kumo Nin, and so the long walk back began. That's the end of this tale for now. Like the video if you enjoyed cause why not and comment down below your thoughts. Check out my other stories and with that being said peace. Thank you.